Join me, 48 Hours Correspondent Erin Moriarty, on my podcast, My Life of Crime, as I take on true crime investigations like no other. This season, I'm looking into the labyrinth of crime and secrets within families. I'm cutting straight to the evidence and talking to the people directly involved, including investigators and the families of victims. Listen to My Life of Crime with Erin Moriarty wherever you get your podcasts. I've got kids, and that means it's always about them. But I need support, too. That's where Ollie comes in, with their delightful, hard-working gummies. My partner and I can actually get a good night's sleep, so we'll both stand a chance of managing our stress responses. Even when the kids are doing parkour in the living room, discover Ollie vitamins and supplements. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Greetings, CHP listeners, every one of you all over the world. Laszlo Montgomery here. So happy you're tuning in. Sometime last Christmas, I was chatting with Graham Earnshaw, and he told me about this new book called Kaleidoscope that was coming out on his fine publishing house where you can get countless books about China and beyond. What struck me first about this story of Uchiyama Kanzo was how Well, you know, in all too many past CHP episodes, especially those concerning topics of late Qing Dynasty and early Republic, where Japan was always concerned, the nation and the people were always presented in a sinister and negative light. Occupiers of Manchuria and all the atrocities and outrages of the Second Sino-Japanese War, and even today there's the occasional frightful news story concerning China-Japan relations. So it isn't that often, where history is concerned, that is, when we get anything uplifting and hopeful that might run counter to that well-known narrative. So rather than a discussion of Japanese and Chinese animosity towards each other, here's a nice story that took place in Shanghai during the Warlord era up to the end of World War II. Amidst all the culture and history that we remember the international settlement of Shanghai for, that time was also one of the most fertile periods in modern Chinese literature. Post May 4th, 1919, all the greats of that time were producing some of their most important work. And one man we're going to look at today was in the middle of that Shanghai scene, Uchiyama Kanzo. And I'm happy to have the author, Dr. Naoko Kato, on the CHB to talk about her new book, Kaleidoscope, the Uchiyama Bookstore and its Sino-Japanese Visionaries. Dr. Kato teaches East Asian history at St. Mark's College at the University of British Columbia. She's also an information resource specialist at the North American Coordinating Council on Japanese Library Resources and an independent historian. Dr. Kato also taught courses in Asian-Canadian and Asian migration at the University of British Columbia and Simon Fraser University, and was formerly a Japanese-language librarian at the University of British Columbia. Welcome to the China History Podcast, Dr. Naoko Kato. Thank you so much for this wonderful introduction. Dr. Kato, what compelled you to write this book? Had anyone ever covered Uchiyama Kanzo before? I'm afraid I had never heard of him. So there are several books, both in Japanese and English, but especially in English, the majority of them have focused on Uchiyama Kanzo's friendship with Lu Xun, based primarily on his autobiography. The bookstore itself has been mentioned usually in passing. For example, Chinese students at school would have used textbooks that mention Lu Xun visiting the bookstore. But there aren't a lot of works that really examine the multiple functions that the bookstore had, especially ranging from the pre-war to the post-war period. And I originally came across this story of the bookstore when I was actually a graduate student taking a Republican China history course. And I was really fascinated by this Japanese-owned bookstore that acted as a Japanese-Chinese cultural salon. During a time when Japan and China were at war with each other, because it was so different from the other stories that I had encountered on this time period that emphasized Chinese nationalism and Japanese aggression. 
But what really compelled me to write this book was to try to overcome this divide that exists between Chinese and Japanese history. And this goes back to when、um, I encountered this issue when I was writing my dissertation, which this book is based upon. And it was because I was writing essentially about the Japanese community in Shanghai. And so, in some people's view, this may not really qualify as Chinese history, even if it's set in China and it played a significant role, even from a Chinese history perspective. So, I was determined to make this story that I thought deserved to be told as both Chinese and Japanese history. And so, I decided to purposely focus on characters. Both Japanese and Chinese characters that try to cross this national divide, and they were often bilingual and bicultural characters themselves. So, after living the life of a wastrel for much of his early years, Uchiyama met Pastor Makino Torachi and converted to Christianity and remained a lifelong practicing Christian. When was this, and how did this change Uchiyama's life? Yeah, Uchiyama actually.、Um, Dropped out of school very early in his life. By the age of twelve, he was working, and、um, he'd gone through stages in which he wasted his money away on dining out, and his parents and relatives cut ties with him for his dishonest conduct. And he even used to believe in a lot of superstition. Around the time of the Russo-Japanese War, you know, Uchiyama was this typical patriotic youth. And、um, he considered himself a failure in society, basically, because he hadn't completed school, and and he kept changing jobs, and he wasn't getting anywhere. So he was at a stage in his life where he'd experienced many failures, and was really feeling like he needed to change the way he had lived. And what he heard at church was really completely different in terms of from what he had known and the way he had lived up until that point. Yeah, and then he met Miki through Pastor Makino, and who was also trying to change her life around. So this was a, a, a turning point in his life. How did he end up in Shanghai? What year was that? Ah,、uh, nineteen thirteen. Actually,、um, he through the church got this job at a pharmaceutical company in Shanghai. So again, he was wanting to change jobs, and and this job came out this opportunity to start anew in a different country.、Um, this was a time when Japanese pharmaceutical companies were expanding into China. It saw, you know. Um, China as a way to increase their revenues, their sales. Uchiyama Kanzo marries、um, Miki in 1916, three years after he goes to Shanghai, and she is the one who actually starts a Christian bookstore in 1917. While Uchiyama continued to work for the pharmaceutical company until 1930. The part in the book that explains Uchiyama's vision for Pan Asianism it differs from the more virulent Japanese government view later manifested in the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. How did Uchiyama view this whole idea of Pan Asianism? I think it's based on his lived experiences, and by that I mean especially the first two years when he was working for the pharmaceutical company. He was selling eye drops. And you know, putting up posters and things along with his Chinese counterparts. So he traveled to all the different cities along the Yangtze River, and he called himself a Japanese coolie,、uh, working alongside Chinese coolies. And、um, you know, Uchiyama had done a lot of different jobs in his past, like cleaning toilets and delivering newspapers. And so I think he felt this affinity with you know people. He wasn't this elitist. So he felt this affinity, I think, in that way, and he also learned a great deal from、um, this because it was during a time of heightened tension already with a lot of anti-Japanese boycotts. And if you just sell these eye drops in a one way, you know, it's not like advertising it in Japan. You you are dealing with 
Chinese people. So he's realizing that it really has to be a reciprocal relationship, not just a one-way relationship. And you need to gain trust in order to gain customers. So I think that differed from just the, the way the government was propagating it because it wasn't working that, that way in a one way. And I also think that his sense of affinity that he felt with his Chinese counterparts had to do with his um, belief in Christianity, like Christian universalism and humanism, I think, played a part because 99% of the Japanese population are, you know, Shintoists or Buddhists. And, and he's this minority 1%, which set him apart in terms of his identity as well, right? Um, so I think it's a combination of his lived experiences and his faith. So let's talk about the man whose interaction with Uchiyama Kanzo was central to the book. Chairman Mao called Lu Xun the greatest and most courageous fighter of the new cultural army. When did this most consequential of 20th century Chinese writers first visit the bookstore? And what were the circumstances that Lu Xun and Uchiyama met? So um, it was in 1927, October. Lu Xun had just moved to Shanghai from Guangzhou. And um, soon after, he visited the bookstore. So April 1927, the Kuomintang under Chiang Kai-shek carried out this full-scale purge of communists in Shanghai. And um, Shanghai becomes a mecca for left-wing writers, with Mao Dun, Guo Moro, and Xia Yan settling in Shanghai because it was the safest and most productive place for writers to be under the protection of foreign concessions rather than being in cities under direct warming down control. So that was the circumstance, like the political circumstance. And in addition, um, when talking about the bookstore, it was a time when it was turning into a Sino-Japanese bookstore. As I said, before um, it, it started off as a very small Christianity related books and basically targeting Japanese Christians. Um, but then it soon started to carry books on regular books that the Japanese residents were demanding that were reading, you know, things on philosophy, etc. So it had actually developed into this bookstore with about 200 shelves. It it was expanding, and it even had um, a table with a couple of chairs where people could chat. Um, so it was expanding. And actually, I'll, let's get back to the, the day in which Lucian visits the bookstore because, um, yeah, the Uchiyama bookstore's um, longtime employee, his name was Wang Hongrian, recalls um, on the first day that Lucian visited he bought more than 10 books, amounting to over 50 yuan, which was more than what the bookstore would actually sell in a day. So it was memorable in that sense. And, you know, from then onwards, he would come every few days, often through the back door, you know, and famously with a pipe <laughs> um, to smoke. And um, he would come to have this designated seat away from the entrance because he was being pursued, of course, and he would be able to, you know, read the books there and um, that he purchased while he was um, having some green tea served by Uchiyama's wife, Miki, from the hometown in Kyoto. And then, you know, he would have conversations with um, Miki and Uchiyama. And what was the attraction of Japanese books to Chinese intellectuals of the 1920s and 30s. In your book, you go beyond Lu Xun and Uchiyama's friendship to include many other uh, characters. So Uchiyama Bookstore actually carried books that were not available from Chinese bookstores because they were considered illegal and um, publication of left-wing books and magazines were severely restricted in the 1930s. But Uchiyama Bookstore carried like medical books, you know, books in the social sciences like Marxist works to reform society. And these were really attracted to these revolutionaries. They carried books on the latest knowledge on Western culture, 
um, capitalism, politics, economics, law, and theories such as um, socialism and Marxism. And they were in fact easier to comprehend for the Chinese population compared to English, especially for returned students of Japan. There were many who studied in Japan. So they would, you know, read Japanese translations of Western works and, you know, Japanese works as well. Um, so on the Chinese side, for example, um, those who became part of the League of Left-Wing Writers under the Chinese Communist Party, like Yu Dafu, Guo Moro, Tian Han, Mao Dun, Xia Yan, and, and the list goes on really, right? And um, we have Chen Dushu and Li Daozhao who co-founded the CCP. These were also Uchiyama's customers, but also... Zhou Zhouren or Qian Daosun and Zhang Zhubin, who were later labelled as traitors or collaborators. So you've got the whole spectrum of people. And what were some of the highlights from the friendship between Lu Xun and Uchiyama Kanzo? So I think the most dramatic ones where, you know, your friendship is tested um, because it does take courage to evacuate um, under these circumstances. So I'm talking about um, the times in which um, Uchiyama actually enables Lu Xun to take refuge while he was being persecuted by the Guomindang. So there were a couple of incidences, and that really it was risky um, to be supplying a place and you know providing food, etc., Pollution. So, so I think those are the times that were highlights. The first time was after the formation of the League of Left Wing Writers in March of 1930. Lucian evacuates to Uchiyama Bookstore for about a month, and in January of 1931, so about a year later, Lucian takes refuge again for about a month as the Guomindan arrested dozens of activists, including League of Left-Wing Writer members. And in February, in fact, some of them actually are executed. So they were in real danger. I mean, Lucian would have been in real danger. So those are some of the highlights. But I also wanted to equally emphasize sort of the daily routine, because that's it doesn't just come out of nowhere, these highlighted events. In fact, he establishes this relationship and this friendship through these daily visits. In actual fact, I think he visited in the span of 10 years about 500 times and then bought about 1,000 books over that course. And I have actually another chapter in an edited volume where I have Lu Xun's diary from May of 1932 that illustrates sort of the, this daily routine. Um, so I'll read a little bit from that. So he, he basically, like every couple of days, he would note down, went to the Uchiyama bookstore, bought this book, it cost this much. So he, he writes that. But in addition, like May 7th, let's say, gift given to Uchiyama Kakichi. Well, Kakichi is Uchiyama Kanzo's brother that I'll later mention. And then... It has passages like, oh, in the morning Uchiyama gave me one box of seaweed received from Uchiyama cigarette tools and a lion dance toy that belonged to Masada. And then the 21st, bought clothes for Uchiyama, Yamamoto, Kamata, Hasegawa, and Uchiyama, Kakichi's wife. So they're like these, these names that come out are people who are connected with the bookstore. And, you know, there's this, this gift giving and it's just, it sort of illustrates that, you know, it's kind of like a neighbor, right? So I think that's important to note. And what were these mandan kai, or wan duan hui, these conversation salons that Uchiyama sponsored? Yeah, I guess uh, mandan kai, the direct translation would be like informal chatting group. Chatting sounds strange, but I guess where you could converse. It was not a real formal organization, like there were no membership fees or rules, but it's just that Uchiyama provided a venue um, for, for people to gather at the bookstore. And it, it ranged from about 10 to 20 people. Um, and in 1929, the bookstore moved and it became bigger. And on the first floor, it would have all the books on sale, but they specifically created the second floor 
um, as a space, like a social space where you could converse over tea. So it was just perfect as a salon. So the types of people who came, you have Japanese residents of Shanghai. Okay, so you've got journalists, artists, I mean, business people. And then you have a core、um, group of returned Chinese students of Japan. And these were writers, poets, and playwrights. And of course, you've got Lushun as well. And in addition, you've got visiting Japanese writers. So in 1923, It becomes easier to travel from Japan to、um, China through the port of Nagasaki. There's a steamship that goes to Shanghai. So there are many Japanese writers who would come, and you know, some of the Chinese return students would have known these writers before when they were in Japan. So it was、um, sort of a natural gathering space. And actually, the title of my book, Kaleidoscope, is based on the magazine that they actually published. This group of People who went to the Mandankai, and it was called Kaleidoscope, which is why I named my book. After the Mukden incident in 1931 and the Japanese takeover of Manchuria, how did Uchiyama step up to become a peacemaker?、Um, so I talked about the two times that Uchiyama helped Lushin evacuate. And the third time, actually, Uchiyama protects Lushun is at the beginning of 1932,、um, following the、um, January 28th incident. So that's a practical way in which I guess you could say that he was playing his part. During this time, from about you know, 1931, he steps up to arrange for translations. Of Lushun's books into Japanese. He is the matchmaker in a sense that he knows good Japanese translators and he would match them with Lushun and they would have sessions on like Chinese literature, make sure that they're on the same page on that. And the bookstore publishes these translated works of Lushun's through the bookstore. Another thing that、um, he engages in is、um, woodblock prints, actually,、um, because you know, Lu Xun is trying to use literature as a tool to change society, but realizes that you know, there's a whole set of people who are not literate. So, woodblock prints would be、um, able to reach a, a larger audience, but they don't have teachers or a movement yet. And here comes actually Uchiyama Kanzo's brother who lives in Tokyo who visits Shanghai. And they start talking and they realize that, oh, he's a school teacher who knows how to actually teach woodblock carving to Chinese emerging artists. So Uchiyama、um, arranges for this. Lu Xun is the translator and the brother teaches at a workshop. And then Uchiyama also arranges exhibits. To display these、um, works by Chinese emerging artists, as well as some of the German and Russian woodblock prints that Lucian had collected. Yeah, last week I was at the Venda Museum here in Culver City. It's a fascinating museum of the Cold War. And I was at a private showing of this very unique exhibit of Cultural Revolution art. And during the tour、uh, given by one of the curators, Jamie Kwan, She introduced woodblock prints and mentioned that, you know, Lu Xun was a popularizer of this style of art. And, and I had just learned all this prior to hearing it, you know, from reading your book. From 1937 until his death in 1959, Uchiyama tried to serve as a bridge between the people of Japan and the people of China. And that, in those years, was not an easy mission given the Mutual feelings on both sides. How did Uchiyama stay positive, and what were some of the things he did, and how did he go about trying to push this boulder up that hill? He resorted basically to publishing essays and giving lectures on China. This was actually the period in which he was most productive in terms of his own literary production.、Uh, he would actually write every day. In the mornings before starting his job at the bookstore, where he continued to sell books to Japanese customers. Because sadly, Chinese customers were no longer visiting and Lucian had just passed away the previous year. And the articles and essays that he published were based on his lived experiences from the 20 years of selling eye drops and, and, and his books. 
And many of the stories were based on the Sino Japanese cultural exchanges that occurred at the bookstore. So I would say that in a way, Uchiyama was trying to revive that spirit or relive it in some ways, all that he had acquired and treasured during those golden years of the 1920s. When、um, face to face Sino Japanese cultural exchanges were still possible. And it's important to note that the, the lectures he was giving and what he was writing about really emphasized the need to make the effort to really understand China, its depth, and really truly understand the Chinese people. And Another thing I guess I would mention is, I mean, in terms of keeping his spirits up,、um, was that he did still keep in touch with many of his friends, his Chinese friends, and, and would reunite with them、um, post war. For example,、um, he helped free some of them from the Japanese thought police. In 1941, Lu Xun's wife, Xu Guangping, as well as、um, Kaiming press managers Xia Mianzun and Jiang Shichen. And even in 1944, actually, they would meet in person for a picnic on ironically May 4th. I'm not sure if that was intentional.、Um, owners of Kaiming press, translators and writers, I mean, so both Japanese and Chinese. I mean, it was a rare occasion, but it, I'm just saying that. It still did continue during this very difficult period. 1945 was a sad year for Uchiyama Kanzo. This phase of his life represented the seventh turn of the kaleidoscope in your book. He took a lot of punches in that year. Can you describe 1945 in the life of Uchiyama Kanzo? Yes, it, was,、uh, it didn't start off well as January 1945. His wife Miki passed away. And、um, Uchiyama was in fact so devastated that he was unable to come out of his house for 10 days. And his friend helped him create this grave for his wife Miki and himself so that he could re- you know, later rejoin her in Shanghai,、um, you know, the grave.、Um, he also loses his dear friend Xia Mianzun from Kaiming Press that I just mentioned. Who wrote the epitaph for Miki's grave? He also passes that year. So it was personally quite a difficult year for him in that sense. But of course, the war also ends in 1945. So all that he had built up to that point、um, is gone. And the bookstore closes and he's forced to return. So,、um, but before that, he's elected to be in charge basically of managing both the livelihood and making arrangements to repatriate the Japanese community in Shanghai. How did Uchiyama's post war life pan out? What happened after he arrived back in Japan? And besides his involvement in the JCFA, what else did he engage in to keep busy? So Uchiyama returns to Japan in 1947 and stays with his brother、um, Kakichi at Tokyo's Uchiyama bookstore that was there. And he really spends the vast majority of the first 17 months back in Japan giving talks on China. And that amounted to about 800 lectures in the span of yeah, 17 months. And when he did get a chance to revisit China,、uh, for example, in 1953, as part of a delegation, he would be busy noting down everything that he observed in terms of the changes that he saw in China and would write about it, publish, and give talks on the new China. And he would keep giving talks until his death, until 1959, when he passed away, which was not actually an easy task during. Period. Because every time one would speak about China, and if let's say you're talking about even promoting trade with China, people were under the impression that China equaled you know, Communist Party, and to even be part of the Sino Japanese Friendship Movement, as it was called, was extremely difficult,、um, considering also that Japan was occupied by the United States、um, until 1952. What kind of events did the Japan China Friendship Association engage in? And is it still around today? Yes, it is. It's still around. One of the things that they were engaged in was returning the remains of Chinese forced laborers 
who worked in Japanese mines, for example, um, and end up dying in Japan. The other part to that was also repatriating Japanese orphans from China. So Uchiyama, for example, went to China in 1953 as part of the effort to repatriate. Um, there were 30,000 Japanese that were left behind at the end of the war. The organization is known for producing content that makes known Japan's wartime so called wrongdoings, highlighting its atrocities that、uh, Japan committed against Chinese. And it's,、um, yeah, it's also involved, for example, in、um, maintaining the peace constitution. So、um, after the war, Japan has this. Article 9 Peace Constitution to never go to war again. So it's, you know, the organization is backing that up. Japan PRC diplomatic relations commenced in 1972 with Prime Minister Tanaka. So prior to normalization and up until his death in 1959, did Uchiyama play any unofficial roles as a middleman between political figures in Japan and China?、Uh, as Chairman of the Sino Japanese Friendship Association, which is a non governmental as- association, Uchiyama certainly devoted his time and energy into the process of、um, advocating for normalization of diplomatic relations. When Guo Moro, for example, came to Japan in 1955, Guo met with member of the Japanese Diet, Kenzo Matsumura. Who was instrumental in forging governmental level ties with China that served as a foundation to the normalization. And Uchiyama was asked from both the Japanese and Chinese sides to be present at the meeting. And of course, Guo Moro was you know, his customer and longtime friend from the bookstore years. So, yes, he, he still tr- was able to play this middleman type of role that he seems to be really good at. How is Uchiyama Kanzo memorialized today? I'm sure your book will go a long way in creating awareness about him. Are there any monuments to Uchiyama in China or in Japan? Yes, in fact, in both places he is. So in Japan, he was born in this pre- prefecture called Okayama Prefecture. And so there is a monument to mark his house where he was born and a statue of Uchiyama. A monument actually with a poem written by Guo Moro is there. And the original books that he published himself are also preserved at the library in Okayama.、Um, in addition, in Japan, as I kind of mentioned before,、um, there is a Tokyo Uchiyama bookstore that was founded by Uchiyama Kanzo's brother back in 1935, which even still to this day exists.、Um, And interestingly enough, it carries, it has always carried everything to do with China. So it's a, it's, it's a sort of a specialized bookstore on things related to China. And it is in this district called Jimbojo, which is a famous district for all different types of bookstores, specialized bookstores, independent bookstores. So that's in Japan. And in China,、uh, we have the Duolong Road Culture Street. With life size bronze statues. This is in Shanghai, in, at the Lushun Museum and the Wanguo Cemetery. You know,、um, Uchiyama is mentioned. But more recently, there's been some exciting news of Uchiyama Bookstore reopening in the city of Tianjin and also in Shanghai. The one in Shanghai is called the 1927 Lushun and Uchiyama Memorial Bookstore. And this one was built around the same time as when my book came out at the end of last year. And that is recreating the Uchiyama bookstore space. And in fact, it is the bookstore、um, in Shanghai is located at the same place where Uchiyama bookstore was. I think the hope is that they would be able to create more of these, I've heard, bookstores around throughout China. Well, Dr. Naoko Kato, I must say this was one enjoyable discussion. Like I said at the outset, I'd much rather hear stories like these that present a positive and friendly side of Sino Japanese relations. Today, as it was back in the Tang Dynasty, there are so many aspects of each other's cultures that were admired and appreciated in China and Japan. And in that respect, I guess 
There was nothing new with Uchiyama Kanzo's embrace of China and his passion to help forge friendship between the two countries. And we're fortunate in our challenging times today to have many Uchiyama Kanzo's around the world who, despite the headwinds, are out in the trenches creating bridges of friendship and understanding with China. Dr. Kato, I thank you once again for coming on to the CHP and talking about your new book, Kaleidoscope, the Uchiyama Bookstore and its Sino-Japanese Visionaries, now out on Earnshaw Books. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate this opportunity. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention, of course, that links to the book will be at the show notes. That is going to be that for this time and for this special episode. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from my lair in Los Angeles, California. Please consider coming back again next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.